It was to be the last meal that Jesus would have with his disciples. John simply records, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto his Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. We've read it before, but have we let it sink into our hearts and absorb the full meaning of that simple phrase? He loved them unto the end. What an incredible love. He could see what was going to transpire in the next 24 to 48 hours. But his heart was focused on his disciples. He loved them unto the end. And I believe, friends, he loves his disciples unto the end today. Do you believe that? Do you find hope and do you find comfort in those words? He loved them unto the end. A simple promise and a simple assurance to us today that Christ loves us unto the end. It was some approximately 60 years later that the writer of John reflected back upon that occasion and scribed the words that we read today. Now think with me if you were writing of a meal that happened 60 years earlier, what would you write? John simply wrote, he loved them unto the end. Follow along in your Bibles to, uh, to the 13th chapter of John, verse 31. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, the scripture records, yet a little while, while I am with you, you shall seek me. And I said unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. So now I say unto you, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you shall have love one for another. It was Jesus' purpose to glorify his Father. And he was simply saying that at this hour, the Father is going to glorify me, I am going to glorify him, and he is going to work through me that glory might go to the Father. I like the address, the way he addresses his disciples. My little children, know fully, be fully aware that this, at this time, I'm going to share with you just a few words that might burn in your hearts until I see you again. He says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. What does it mean in those few words so concise? Jesus was trying to tell his disciples that we ought to love him and love one another as he loved us. A word that we so often use, that's so often misunderstood. What does it mean to love one another? Just three or four thoughts this morning. First, I'd like to suggest to you that love is proactive. Because Jesus says, a new commandment I give you. Not one that, not one that is at antithesis or opposite of the Ten Commandments, but one that expands it even further. Love is always proactive. 
The Ten Commandments, while having proactive features, tend to be ten prohibitions. And they tend to be passive statements designed to keep us out of trouble. When they say the speed limit is 65 miles an hour, and you shall not go 67 miles an hour on the interstate, or you will pay what is commonly called a penalty, sometimes referred to as a use tax, and some of you more frequently than others. That is a passive way of traveling safely, safely down the highway. The proactive way is to drive safely, and that's understood under 65 miles per hour. But love is proactive, not just passive. And it takes a proactive stance in living for Christ. Love is active. It is alive. It is to be experienced. It is sensitive. It is engaging and engaged upon. It is, um, it is expressed. Love must be embraced and flow from our lives into the lives of others, or it will never be love in its fullest. It may be a passive appreciation for the commands of God. It may be a passive love, but love unexpressed is hardly love at all. When you tell your spouse, I love you, at the altar and don't express it for 30 years later, and he or she is complaining and saying, I would like to hear those words again, and you respond, wait a minute, I told you 30 years ago, and if anything changes, I will let you know. And somehow, it's not enough. It's not enough to say I'm a Christian and everybody knows that I love them. Jesus said it must be expressed. It must be embraced. It must be love that flows inside of your heart and expresses actively to those you come in contact with. The purpose of that love, just one other quick thought, the purpose of that love that Jesus had with his Father and to his Father was to glorify, to glorify the Father. Love flows out and glorifies those which we love. Can you say amen? amen. Oh, you guys remember what it was like. It may have been recently, or it may have been multiple decades. You saw her across the room, and you sought to get to know her name. Maybe warmly received at first, maybe you needed to work to get her attention, or maybe you needed to work to get his attention, as the case might have been. And as you struck up that conversation, all you could think about after a while was how you could become better acquainted and what, how much better your life would be and hers or his, as the case may be, if you would only seek to make their life better by glorifying them with your presence. You see, the linkage in love is to exalt someone other than yourself to glorify someone other than yourself. A loving relationship always looks to move beyond yourself into the life of the other. And love is not complete until it is, it is experienced and expressed in that fashion and in that way. Jesus was saying, you may love me, but I'm going to tell you as a group of disciples, you have experienced my love now go forth from this place and love one another as I have loved my Father. Love must be expressed and love seeks to glorify somebody other than ourselves. Love also has two very quick characteristics that I would like to touch on just ever so briefly. There's an aspect of love that it's easy to say, I love you. It's easy to say, I love you, until the relationship goes adrift. 
And I don't know how it happens, but it's bound to happen. No matter how much you love somebody, at some point in time, you're not going to see things exactly the same. And it's the other person's strong will that gets in the way. If only they could see the right way to do it, then they would understand and do it my way. Now, it probably hasn't happened to that magnitude in your life, or hopefully not very frequently. There's an aspect of love that moves beyond ourselves, And when those tensions come into relationships, it moves beyond being passive and waiting for somebody to change their ideas of how the relationship to, should work to embracing ideas that are different than what we individually prefer or want to have. And even moves beyond that when the relationship is strained to love forgives. You see, forgiveness is all about giving. And in the heart of Christ, was the forgiveness that he extends to each one of us, each one of you today. Proactively, he sought you out to forgive your sins long before you desired that forgiveness. He says in Psalms, he says, when, when we forgive, when we ask his forgiveness, he says that as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from what? from us. Do you like that? Do you like that idea? As far as the east is from the west, he removes our transgressions from us. He puts us on the east side of the equation, and on the west side he puts our transgressions. Now think with me for just a moment. It's kind of an interesting, uh, it's kind of an interesting use of language, because the psalmist could have said, as far as the north is from the south, he puts our transgressions from us. The problem, though, is there's a finite measurement of north and south. Because if you're at the south pole and you, follow all, you, you travel all the way to the north pole and you travel beyond it, you're heading north all the way to the north pole. And when you step over the north pole, which way are you heading now? South, back to your transgressions. But as far as the east is from the west, you can circle the globe heading west and never finish. So God is saying, when you're forgiven, your transgressions go one way and you go another. Oh, I got it. I love it. I embrace it. I embrace it to the extent that I feel forgiven. But wait a minute, how about applying it as Jesus wants us to apply it? Love one another as I have loved you. Oh, wait a minute. I must, my love must proactively offer forgiveness because it's a gift just as Christ offered it to me. So that when that transgression happens, whether it's in a marital relationship, whether it's in a, a family relationship with a brother and sister, or on the job or in the community or in the church, I say, whether they've asked it or not, I'm going to forgive them. And I'm going to separate that transgression and the pain in our relationship. And I'm going to start over anew in my relationship with those individuals. They will know you are my disciples when you have love for one another. The last piece with love is that love humbly serves one another. It's an active verb. It doesn't wait. It serves when, there's, when, there, is a, a, when there is a need perceived when there is a need expressed, it serves to the capacity that we become the hands, the feet, the voice, the ear of Jesus in ways that draws people 
in to the body of Christ and into a relationship with Christ. So I would just ask, friends, as we partake in the, of the communion service today, that you would reflect on the words of Jesus so often used, so easily understood that 60 years later, as simple as they are, when they're fully manifested in our lives, our hearts and lives will be filled with a greater appreciation of God's love for us and our full expression of love for one another. For Jesus said, I would that you would love one another. May his love be made manifest as we partake in the communion service today. We will uh, we will separate at this time the locations for our foot washing service, which is a service of humility. The men will meet in the Sabbath school room B. As we leave the sanctuary, you'll just go down the diagonal to the classrooms. The ladies' room has been changed from the fireside room to classroom C, and the families will meet in the far end in the multi-purpose room. Seventh-day Adventists practice what is typically referred to as the ordinance of humility. As in the time of Christ, he washed his disciples' feet. We do so also as a symbol of humility in serving one another. If you'd like to care to participate and observe or participate, please uh, join the group that you'd like to. If you'd like to pray in the sanctuary, we will uh, return to the sanctuary in just a few minutes for the partaking of the emblems of the bread and the wine. May God bless us as we serve one another at this time.